Hello Sector Watchers, welcome to the 37th episode of Sector Spotlight on Tuesday the 30th of June, recorded on the 29th. I'm Julius de Kempenaar, your host for today's show and presenting from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. I love to hear from you, so if you watch the show on YouTube, please don't forget to like the video or even better, share your thoughts, ideas, suggestions, etc. in the comment section below. I do read them and I respond to legitimate comments or questions. Of course, you can always send an email or use any of the social media handles to stay in touch. We are nearing the end of the month, so we'll be looking ahead to the new month of July using seasonality in combination with RRGs. We will take a look at the rotation of US markets against other international stock markets. And I will also get back to the discussion that we had last week on the use of technical analysis on non-tradable assets like the VIX. I got quite a few comments and remarks on that one. So I guess the good news is that there are actually people watching the show. But before we dive into these items, we will first have a look at what happened last week and try to put things into perspective. Last week's sector performance wasn't very strong. Here on the left, I have loaded up the RRG for US sectors over the last five trading days ending on last Friday. And what we see is um, that the S&P only lost 2.8%. But if we look at the breakdown in the table, it is pretty clear that the only reason why the S&P only lost 2.8% is because technology lost only 0.4, so 40 bips. Um, the other ones above the S&P 500 were materials and consumer discretionary, and they are in line with the market, minus 2.6 and minus 2.5. And look at you know all the sectors below. So from healthcare all the way down to energy, they, they, these sectors have all been underperforming the S&P 500. Um, so the only reason why this market didn't totally collapse is because technology is holding us higher. If we look at the RRG, then what strikes me is that there are only three sectors that are moving from left to right, which means it's positive. And, and actually, there's only one that's traveling at a positive RRG heading, and that is the healthcare sector. That's the only one that's traveling between zero and 90 degrees. The other two that are positive are staples and technology, but they've already dropped below 90 degrees. So they're, they're between 90 and 180. That's not bad, but they lost a little bit of their, of their mojo, of their momentum. So um, the conclusion, I think, is that uh, definitely for the near term, is that the participation uh, in the market is very narrow. It's pretty much technology, and then a, lot of, a long time nothing, and then staples and healthcare. <laughs> with healthcare actually picking up a little bit. Now, let's quickly move on to a little bit longer term picture and bring seasonality into the mix as we usually do um, at the start of the new month. And it's a bit of a disappointing picture, I'm afraid, because if you look at the um, season, seasonal patterns for July, there is a lot at 45, 50, 55, 60, which pretty much is um, a, coin, a, a toss of the coin. Um, and the only ones that are standing out are communication services and real estate. And the problem is that these are the only two sectors with very limited historical data to base the seasonality on. And it's especially also uh, only data from a, a time when the market was really, really strong. So I, I, I'm very reluctant to make a call based on seasonality because it's such a mixed bag and, and it can go either way. And also if I try to, to put that into a longer term RRG, then I see that real estate is right here inside the lagging quadrant. It's starting to curl up. Is that a sign that it can be a stronger sector going forward? I'm not sure. This is not a very strong position. Um, and then we have communication services inside leading. So that is sort of coinciding, but communication services has also already rolled over. So I'm not sure if that's going to be a real strong sector. And then, you know, the, um, 
the best sector of the pack still technology has a 60 percent outperformance in july so you know again it's, it's going to going to be a little bit boring but it looks as if uh, uh, the technology sector is once again going to be our best bet in terms of seasonality uh for the coming month if we look at the performances there is uh there's a couple of interesting things the communication services is uh, suggesting half a percent outperformance what is a strong negative is for energy minus 1.4 percent um you know the the the, the outperformance was 50 50 but the, the expected underperformance is minus 1.4 over all these years that's one that we're going to look at same for utilities minus 1.1 and then real estate has an average outperformance of 1.7 percent so maybe but it's it's a real long shot real estate could do something uh, maybe together with technology but again it's uh, i'm very very reluctant to to rely on the seasonal pattern um, uh, for this month going forward if i look at the uh, s p 500 i see a market that is going sideways we have just touched the mid of the gap that's going to be that's a serious resistance level now and the level that i am watching for the s p 500 like a hawk is 2965 that that seems to be to me a very important level if we break that we're going to see more downside um whether it's going to happen i don't know because on the other side we have 3233 which is the number that probably is going to cause a lot of pain when it breaks uh, and the market goes higher and if i read all the comments everywhere i think that the biggest risk for this market is uh, a break to the upside because a lot of people are expecting downward pressure uh, so if we break to the upside that's probably the biggest risk for this market Let's move on to uh, a look at the international perspective for, uh, and for equity markets. One of the RRGs that I keep an eye on, that I keep watching from time to time, is the RRG that shows the rotation of international equity markets versus the Dow Jones Global Index. Uh, it includes the S&P 500, so you could also say uh, the U.S. versus the rest of the world. It's actually a, um, a predefined group on the RRG page. If you go into the groups drop down and scroll all the way down to international here, then you will see international stock market indexes. And if you click that, you will load up the RRG that... I already have had up there now what <clears throat> what is interesting to see is that there is a uh, there's a whole cluster of markets here in the top left improving quadrant that is moving higher on both scales so they're gaining in terms of relative strength and they're also gaining in terms of relative momentum and to put things into perspective here is the S&P 500 and you see that the US um, was leading for quite some time and very recently if I scroll back that's like a month six weeks ago the US started to roll over lose relative momentum and is now inside the weakening quadrant and heading towards lagging um, let there be no mistake the US is still in terms of relative strength one of the stronger markets as you know the rs ratio is the most important metric uh, in terms of rrg and the s p is the second highest on the list so from that perspective the us is still a strong market but it seems to be losing at least in the near term against a whole cluster of markets now i'm most interested in the markets that are showing a um, a strong RRG heading, which means that they're moving in a northeasterly direction, or if you compare it to a compass between 0 and 90 degrees. And the closer to the 100 level on the RS ratio scale, the stronger it is. Now, if we just look at a few of these markets, then Brazil catches our attention because it has such a high level of momentum. And you can see that right here. Here is the chart of the Bovespa. 
Um, it had a very strong rally, very sharp rally, and you see that reflected in the rise of relative strength. But you also see that it is far to the left on the RRG, and that is because you see that it has rolled over and the RS ratio line is still way below 100. So it'll be very difficult for the Bovespa, especially because it is now pushing against what seems to become a pretty heavy resistance area to, to um, continue rising. Uh, and that will have very likely an effect on the relative strength of the Bovespa versus the Dow Jones Global. So despite the short-term momentum, the short-term rise, this is a dubious market. I, 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 this is not a strong buy for me at the moment yet. We need a lot more um, strength in price and relative strength to make that work. If we move from left to right and we now go to Russia, to the R. TSI, then we see a slightly better picture because Russia has managed to go beyond this gap area. It's going higher. The relative strength is in a very broad range and it's now moving higher. Uh, it's not as bad as the uh, Brazilian relative strength that we saw, uh, but still it's way below the 100 level on the uh, RRG lines on the RS ratio level. So uh, again, a little bit stronger, but not strong enough. If we move further to the right and we go to uh, the Nifty 500, the Indian index, we see a similar image. Um, very heavy resistance area where it ended up right now. The rally was very nicely and very strong. That is causing that strong momentum that we saw in the RRG lines and that's causing the sharp rally here and, and the relatively long tail for the nifty on the RRG, but it looks to have run its course. Um, so it'll be, again, also for the nifty, be very difficult to rally further. Uh, and we need a lot more upside action in price and therefore also in relative strength to make this a serious uh, buying or outperformance candidate. Then we have Australia, the All Ordinaries Index, and you see here also a sharp rise. This is getting a little bit better because it has held up above the 2018 lows, 2018 lows in relative strength. And it's sort of holding up here and maybe putting in a new low. It's difficult to see on the individual RS ratio lines, but that's why we have the RRG. You can see that we're getting closer to the 100 level and that means that the odds for a rotation towards leading are increasing. So for the Australian um, All Orts Index, uh, the, the uh, odds are getting better. Uh, also, when you look at the price chart, you see that we have not yet reached the horizontal resistance level that we've seen touching in India and in Russia and in Brazil. If we, go one notch further to the right, we end up with the European Dow Jones Index, the Dow Jones Europe Index. Again, not very strong if you look at the longer term, but it, it is leveling off in the last few months. We have not broken to new lows and the RS ratio is getting closer to 100. So the odds are improving for relative strength to curl upward here. And if we look at the price chart, you see that there is a nice higher highs and higher lows rotation in play. We have a little bit more upside until we reach that previous high. If that breaks, we got another bit of fuel for that move. But this resistance is a lot less than that we saw, for example, in the All Lords and in India. So we're getting better and better and better here. Um, and then finally, the one that I want to share with you is the Japanese index, because you see that all these blue ones are traveling at a strong RRG heading, but still insight improving, getting a little bit better the closer they get to the 100 level on the RS ratio axis. Um, but the Nikkei index, Japan, has already crossed above 100. It's now inside the leading quadrant. And if you look at the chart, you see that there is no resistance. It's not. The other ones were like, bouncing against what would be the equivalent of 20,000 in the Nikkei. The Nikkei just passed beyond that. 
um, just made a new high looks as if it's putting in a new low there's plenty of upside here we can move all the way up to this this is going to be a heavy resistance area between around 24,170 and also in the uh, relative strength line you see a range and we're moving to the upper boundary if those two can continue to move in sync and price breaks higher followed by relative strength to break higher you can see this improvement of the RS ratio um, to continue and to push the Nikkei index further into the leading quadrant and the the, the most important thing to compare it with is the, uh, the, the, the S&P 500 because pretty much all the charts that we've seen so far, we saw falling relative strength that started to curl up and it was not as good in Brazil and it's looking pretty good in Japan. And if we now look to the US market, then we see that it's all, almost the other way around. We had a very strong relative strength that's not be able to push higher it's rolling over and you see that the RRG lines are now moving lower so we're getting this opposite rotation of the US versus a lot of other markets in the world uh, and I think that at least for the near term that means that the US is going to lose some of its strength especially versus Japan and maybe also versus a few of these others but especially versus Japan um, if we switch to uh, to Japan, you may have noticed that I'm using the underlying indexes to run this RRG. And that's because I want to eliminate the currency uh, effect that happens when you load up a similar chart, but using ETFs. But at the end of the day, the ETF is the instrument that we can buy to get a position in, in this case, the Japanese market. And that would be E. WJ, the iShares MSCI Japan Index. This would be the investable instrument that you can buy to get a position um, with exposure to the Japanese market. The, the chart itself uh, is, um, you know, if you, if you look through your eyeballs, that eyebrows, that is roughly the same chart. You see slight differences, but not massive. The differences that you see have to do with the exchange rate between the dollar and the yen and for me that is a separate decision so I think okay I like Japan so I need to buy AWJ uh, ETF to get exposure the next question I ask myself what does that mean for my currency exposure so I need to load up the dollar yen chart and I see a currency that is trading in a range between roughly 105 and 112 113 so that's not a lot that we will um, that we will have to um, uh, there's not a lot of risk there I don't think that this currency exchange rate um, uh, gives me a lot of currency risk so I'd be happy to buy the ETF to track the Japanese market and to potentially profit from the uh, strong rotation of the Japanese market versus the S&P 500. This is a, a good way to keep an eye of the US performance versus the rest of the world and maybe get some diversity in your portfolio if from time to time the US market uh, loses a little bit of, of, of relative strength versus other markets in the world. Last week in the mailbag, I answered a question whether it was feasible to apply, to apply technical analysis to, let's say, non-tradable assets or symbols. <clears throat> and I had the I used the example of the VIX index because the VIX, as we know, is the result of price movements of underlying stocks on the implied volatility that option traders price into 
the premium of the options. Um, uh, I got actually quite a, quite a few responses uh, to it and someone even called me out and said, but hey, you're doing exactly the same when you do uh, RRGs or you promote RRGs using uh, breath data um, to get a different angle. So I think I need to, first of all, I think I wasn't clear enough in my explanation. Uh, so I need to clarify a little bit more and maybe um, give some, some more nuance uh, to the answer. Because uh, first of all, uh, so it's not that I do not I don't, it's not that I don't think that these types of metrics, these types of values are not valuable to our process of technical analysis. Um, as a matter of fact, I do think they're, they're really valuable. I think the VIX is a valuable indicator. I do think, as you, as you may have noticed, that I think that, the, um, for example, the, the number of uh, stocks trading above that 200-day moving average on the S&P or per sector, um, the bullish percent index, advanced decline, they're all very valuable metrics. What I meant to say is that I don't think that they qualify to apply, and maybe I should say classical technical analysis, like support and resistance, trend lines, channels, price formations, all that kind of stuff. And to a certain extent, also indicators. Um, I, I've, I've loaded up two charts on my screen to, to give it a try to explain what I mean. Now, here on the left-hand side, you see the VIX and the dimmed gray line behind it is the S&P 500. And below it is the RSI of the VIX, and below that is the MACD of the VIX. Now, the, the, well, the problem, the, the, the fact of the VIX is that it cannot go below zero. Um, so, if you, if you talk about marking support and resistance, so what is support here? Is that, is that, nine or 10 level, is that support? And what does that mean? I mean, that hardly ever gets broken. And, and when it gets broken, what does it mean? And also the upside is sort of a limit around, well, that's 25, maybe 30, and then some extremes. What does it mean if that breaks? Is, is everybody buying the VIX? No, not everybody's buying the VIX. The market is getting more volatile. Um, and that's what that indicator shows you perfectly. So with that respect, it is a very valuable indicator. But look at when you plot the RSI on the VIX index. I don't think that that's a valuable metric. I mean, you don't have to agree with me, but I don't think that this is going to help me a lot. Um, maybe you want to look for some divergences and, and make a call on that. I, I just don't think that that works or does it. Look at the MACD. It's maybe a little bit more pronounced. So here is, here is a high, a pretty pronounced high that follows the high in the VIX here. And then you got one here. Is this, is this divergence? I don't think it's divergence. So, so here is divergence. Here you see, well, it's not even divergence because we're, we're looking at the VIX and the VIX makes a lower high and the MACD makes a lower high. So there's no divergence. So what does it do here? This is, this is divergence. But where is my trigger? I see very shallow rising lows in the MACD and very shallow uh, falling lows in the VIX. So where is, where is my trigger? It lasts for a year and a half. So I find it very difficult to, to make sense of, um, let's say, oscillators on the VIX. Of course, you can draw a moving average through the VIX if you want to smooth it out a little bit. Totally fine. But I don't think like, like calling divergences between the VIX uh, and its own RSI going to make any sense, nor does it make sense to call support and resistance because there's some sort of, of um, natural support and resistance levels in the, in the VIX. And if we go to, um, to the number of stocks trading above their 
200 day moving average in the S&P 500, it gets even worse because the VIX is limited on one side, it's, you know, it can't go below zero and the upside is theoretically probably indefinite, but well, there are, it's, it's pretty clear that 30 is a, is a high level and then you've got some extremes. If you go to an indicator like the number of stocks trading above its 200 day moving average, that is, that is a range bound indicator. That's, that's between zero and 100. If, the, if it's zero, there is zero stocks trading above their moving average. And if, they're, um, uh, if it's at 100, all 500 stocks are trading above that 200 day moving average. Now, what, what can I say in terms of support and resistance? There is no real support and resistance. I mean, the, the, the ultimate resistance is 100 and the ultimate support is at zero. But I don't think that, say, we have these lows here around 25. If we break below 25, is that a sell signal? I don't know, you're pretty late. Is, is this a sell signal when you when you break below your previous low and, and where is your buy signal? That's what I mean. I mean, you can't really use these types of metrics to, to mark support and resistance. And again, this is the RSI of that uh, stocks trading above that 200 day moving average. I, I don't see any valuable information. And by the way, we're creating a range bound zero to a hundred indicator um, based on a range bound metric. That, for me, that doesn't click. So once and for all, I really do think that all these, let's call, let's call them non-tradable symbols have value, but have value in their own merit. I don't like to call support and resistance on these. I don't like to, like say, run an RSI on these. Maybe like a moving average. The moving average is, is just a, you know, smoothing out some wild indicator. That, that, I get that. that, that makes sense. But creating a range bound oscillator on a metric that in itself is all, already range bound, for me, that's a step too far. I don't see I don't see the added value to that. Do I see the added value of using these types of indicators to as auxiliary to help support certain views or or scenarios? Most definitely yes. So I hope that there's a little bit nuance to my answer now and that clarifies what I meant with not you not applying technical analysis to these types of indicators that doesn't mean that they're not valuable in themselves because they are but you've got to be careful with applying certain techniques that are based on um on buying and selling forces in in like in a stock or something like that anyway i hope it make i hope it made that clear uh and if you still want to discuss it Feel free, my mailbox is open, send your thoughts and, 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 and ideas. Uh, and if it makes sense, I'll get back to it another time. But for now, I hope this clarifies my answer of last week. And this was Sector Spotlight. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like the video and leave your comments below. Sector Spotlight airs every Tuesday from 10.30 to 11 a.m. Eastern with replays on the Stock Charts YouTube channel. If you want to stay up to date on developments around relative rotation graphs, please check out my blog on stockcharts.com. When you subscribe using the link below each article, you will get a nudge each time a new article is posted. For now, please stay safe and I hope to see you back again next week. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.